joining us right now, making this Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show debut, a pretty good friend of mine, Fox analyst, Cleveland native, John Fanta. John, what's going on, man? Guys, it's great to be with you. It's great to be on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show for the first time. I love your guys' work. I love what you're doing in Cleveland. It's unlike any content that the city sports scene has. So it's a thrill to be with all of you. John, we appreciate you taking appreciate some time. It. We'll get into the real stuff first, but I see you got a mini basketball hoop over your right shoulder there. John, how many times a day do you walk past that, take a shot, dunk, and, and yell Kobe? I, I, if it's under 10, I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> well, I, you know, I love the Mamba mentality, and I love Kobe Bryant. But for me, all I hear is a PA announcer saying Z for Zadrunas Sogaskis. That's my childhood. That's so I, I try to – I always try growing up to mimic the Ogalskis. It, it looked like it was in slow motion. The baseline jumper from 15 feet away <laughs> that seemingly always went in. I will never forget when Zadrunas Sogaskis, Jason Lloyd, correct me if I'm wrong, he hit three threes in Sacramento – in a game, LeBron era, uh, and, and, and Fred McLeod and Austin Carr are on the call. And Ogaskis just goes off in the second half and ends up canning three triples. The game was well out of reach. But I love Big Z. Uh, he used to go to Mitchell's Tavern. I grew up in Westlake. That guy would house like a dozen and a half wings. And he was the nicest, he's, he was the nicest guy in the world to everybody. Wonderful. Wonderful human being. I know Z fairly well he's great he's a great guy do he be there all the time is he still with the organization z no not uh, not an official capacity. okay okay because i know he was doing some stuff before like a little bit yeah he yeah. he he's not made for front office type role <laughs> yeah. not in that organization yeah, he's not doing that. so john but right before you came on we were talking about the Cavs and some of their their current roster construction they currently have two bigs who at the moment today would be considered non-shooters do you see a fix within this current roster we were talking about maybe or hopefully having Evan Mobley develop a jump shot that could kind of unlock this team's offensive potential? Or do you believe it has to come from someone outside, whether it be free agency or trade? So it's funny because I, I, I could relate to Jason before when you guys were talking about this situation of that when we're talking about these hypotheticals and scenarios, uh, as I talked about yesterday on a, on a different show, Sometimes your words can get taken as either something that you know or or, or basis that you've got. Uh, I, I'll give my opinion. I think that it's got to come away from the roster. Uh, I don't think that the Cavaliers can fix their problems and be a team that has a chance to contend for a championship with their current roster construction, which obviously the fans agree with today. I also don't think that they should get ripped apart or torn down by any means or overly criticized for the way that Kobe Altman and Mike Ganzi and his team, their, their team, have constructed their roster. I don't think in any way anybody should be overly critical of how the Cavaliers have constructed this team. Part of the nature of the roster that they have with – nine players under the age of 25 is that you you've got a team that's learning on the fly that's developing on the fly and that's relying on growth now the question i have heading into this season the two questions i have are number one after you got embarrassed by the new york knicks you got embarrassed by the new york knicks if the regular season is diminished in its value, which I think we all agree that it is, mm -hmm. and the playoffs is what it's all about, which it should be, how do you become a legitimate threat to win the Eastern Conference? If you're not thinking that way, I don't know why you're doing it then. Because you were just in a 4-5 series. You were the four seed. You got beaten five games. That, that was... A bigger alarm to me than I think the Cavaliers front office made it to be when the season ended. They, they gave front office speak. That's what they did. I don't mind them for that. I'm not going to blame them for that. We hear that every day in Berea. It's going to happen uh, over with the Cleveland Browns. It's going to happen. You, you hear it with the Guardians. You hear it with any professional organization. But 
if they don't go out and make a move of significance or moves of significance, I'm sorry. When has running it back worked really well in the NBA? In the NBA where there's a totally different season within the year. That is the off season where you've got to improve your roster. How do they do that? They've got a conundrum there. But it's why I've had the opinion where I think, I think, I don't, I don't think Donovan Mitchell's going to be here a long, long time. Okay? I think there's a window open for the Cavs to keep building towards a title. Like, isn't that the way that they should be thinking? If you're the four seed in the East, shouldn't you be thinking about how can we get up into the top three? How can we make the next move? That next move doesn't happen with the guys you currently have. I do think that it comes down to more than just natural development. I think it's going to come down to reeling in a piece or two and potentially doing something that might ruffle some feathers in the moment, but I wouldn't blame them if they tried to do something different because I got to tell you guys, in the NBA, it, this is not a four- to six-year type of thing, a three- to five-year let's wait and see. That's not this league. Teams get better overnight. Teams go for that championship. So now I'm wondering if the Cavaliers, what they're thinking behind closed doors of, okay, how do we build on this with the core that we've got, and how do we go for it? You know, John, I'll, I'll let you know. I, I agree with you. Like, for me, I, I'm I, the way I like to talk about things, I'm aggressive. Like, I don't got no time. I'm 41. I don't got time to be waiting three, four years for nobody. Um, and to be honest, you're, you are correct. Every single year, these guys in offseason are getting better or you're either getting worse or, you, or, you, or, you, or you're getting better. And so from my standpoint, um, I do think um, that they would question and go back and, and really rethink the Donovan Mitchell trade. If you go back to last year, do you think that they have some, I wouldn't say buyer's remorse, but do you think that they would think about that trade uh, 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 a little bit differently because of the way the season ended up last year and kind of the restraints they put, they put on the organization. I don't think so because I don't think that you're the four seed in the Eastern conference without getting him. Uh, and I do think that this season they did take major steps. I mean, are you going to have remorse for getting a guy who look at, look at the numbers? I mean, y you can't argue with that. He sets a franchise single game record for points scored. Now, to, to be able to do what he does consistently is fantastic. Uh, but the consistency hasn't translated to the most important time of year. Now, in fairness, in fairness, part of Donovan Mitchell's career arc is for him to be able to figure that out. And maybe in year one, playing with Darius Garland and, and playing with this new group of players maybe year two means that there's a better opportunity to figure those things out but i i'm not going to be critical of the cavaliers going for a guy who i think is a top five bucket getter in the nba i i really do believe that uh if you want to criticize him for his lack of postseason success i'm not going to say that's unfair i don't think anybody would say that's unfair but when they had the opportunity to get donovan mitchell there was a group of, of followers and people uh, that are fans um, that said, well, I really like Colin Sexton. Uh, I, I think we can build around him you know, or, or build with him, rather. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're not going to, to keep a guy like that if you have the opportunity to get Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchells don't grow on trees. Like they, they, they're, they don't just grow on trees. They're, you can't just, in Cleveland, you can't just have your chance to get a player that good every offseason. It's not there unless you're doing something just be beyond bold or, or something crazy with your team or, or, or there's, a, there's a terrible breakup or something like that. Like, there are certain circumstances that had to fit in for the Cavs to even have the opportunity to get Donovan Mitchell. So I don't regret that at all. They should have no remorse for getting Donovan Mitchell to me, this is more than just a Donovan Mitchell problem. They don't have a bench. They, they, they do not possess a bench. I mean, if you look at these other playoff teams, look at how the Miami Heat made a run, albeit improbable. I get it. I know it was surprising. They had a bench. They had depth. They had Gabe Vincent. They had Caleb Martin. 
They had Max Struess come up and hit shots. The Cavaliers don't have that. Like, let's not lie to ourselves here. If you think Chetty Osman's going to be on a team that makes a deep, deep Eastern Conference playoffs run, you're sorely mistaken. And it's not to put him down. It's just, let's we got to look at the reality of the picture here. The Cavs are not deep. They have a depth problem. And in a playoff series, that matters. The Knicks had more depth. They had more toughness. And that's why they totally wore the Cavaliers down. So I do think that there's things that need fixing. Uh, I, 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 Again, I would just say the Cavs got humiliated by the New York Knicks. I don't think that that front office feels any good about where they, they might tell us that they do, but they got to be pissed off with the way this season ended because it it washed away the opportunity to fully validate a 51 win regular season. John, my man, I want to play off of that. So I heard you yesterday on a, another local uh, sports radio talk station and me and you share the same sentiments. I think I text you about it. The Cavaliers overall as a team is soft. And when you're soft as a team and you've been exposed as soft by the rest of the league, it is really tough to run it back. But when you go to acquire talent going forward, you just can't outright ask a player, you know, do you have toughness? So in your opinion, how can they, how can they get over that hump of finding guys to fit the mold of being tough, both physically and mentally going forward? It's a great question, Earl. And I guess you sit here and say, all right, well, if we did get a top four seed in the Eastern Conference and we did win 51 games, is there something or someone internally that that toughness can continually come from? And, and you know, I, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I, I, I do think that you've got to be strategic in what you do. I, 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 I understand what – I thought Jason before – I came on, made, made the point of just talking about the potential of, of Jared Allen and Evan Mobley and how that dynamic works and the scenarios that could come up with, with potentially making a deal or doing something with Allen. I mean, those are all obviously things that, that could pop up in our, our, our hypotheticals. But, like, I, I just – here's my thing. All right, here's my course of logic with, with, with this, Earl, and, and you guys tell me if, if I'm wrong. You don't have depth. Uh, there's not a whole lot to fear coming in off the bench. You've got a core four, but you you don't have a great team. To me, do you have to potentially break off one of those core four to make the team better? I, I think that that's what's going to end up having to happen. And I also think that Jared Allen and Evan Mobley works for the period of time you brought up the regular season. I don't think it works in the playoffs. And I think the fact that it doesn't work in the playoffs means the writing's on the wall. I love Evan Mobley. Uh, I don't think he, he's touchable at all. I think he's got a terrific upside. I think his combination of athleticism and explosiveness is really special. And the motor speaks for itself. I, I really like this kid. I think he's only going to continue to get better. Uh, but I do think that I, I think there's such a thing as, and, and this is kind of how I view the, the Cavs as a whole. They've got some pieces that have helped them get to a really nice point. All right. That, that's a good thing. It's a positive thing. It's not a loss. It's an organizational win. They were in the darkness for a couple of years, not a long time after LeBron James. I mean, we should, Cavaliers fans should be grateful that they've got winning basketball in this town. It didn't take them 10 years to figure stuff out or seven years to figure stuff out. I mean, they've, they've, they've developed a, a plan, and the plan has gone well. But sometimes the guys who helped you get on the map might not be the ones to elevate your franchise to the next runs of the ladder. That sometimes is hard to swallow. Because those guys did help you get to a certain point. But like any great company that's trying to evolve, you might have to rip some Band-Aids off and take an educated risk. I, I don't think it's going to come this offseason. I, 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 I don't think that the chances are high of that. But you might end up having to do that at some point. Because if you don't do that at some point, 
your window could close. Here's the argument I guess I would make for not making major changes and running it back. And I know I just got done saying maybe at the trade deadline you have to make a move. But the Denver Nuggets did pretty well for themselves by staying the course yeah. and staying patient. They didn't have they and, and they were a young team that kind of grew together, Jamal Murray and Jokic, and let them grow together and figure things out. And the Cavs are so young and they sort of emerged quicker than we thought that they would. They went from really, really bad to pretty good pretty quickly. And yeah. and that I think and then the Mitchell trade I think skews the timeline. And that, you know, they did to themselves. And I agree with you. I don't think they regret the trade. I don't think it was a bad trade. But that certainly speeds up the clock. But I think that there's something to be said for you just have to let this thing, you have to let these guys mature and you have to let this play out. Denver went from, I think it was like 46, 47, 48 win team to 53 in a championship. And Jokic is in year eight. Eight. Murray's in year seven. six, seven. One year after, yeah. So, you know, we're talking about Evan Mobley who's going into year three and Darius who's going into year four. We want it like that, but sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. I don't know if there's a question in there. It was just a rebuttal, I guess. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a, this is a great debate. I mean, I, I think, and Jason, you've been around the league long enough to know that these, these processes have different results. I mean, the Nuggets case is a refreshing one. They did stay patient. Jamal Murray was crying at one point thinking he might not be a part of the Denver Nuggets when he tore his ACL. They kept faith in him. Yeah. They kept faith They kept faith that he would be a great player still after the torn ACL, a confident player, a leader. You know, I would say that, and, and I, I did bring up on a local program yesterday the possibility of, of that I wouldn't be surprised if they did something bold. And honestly, I, I it was a take. It was an opinion. Um, Jason, the the guy who hosts that program, he knows how to get people in trouble quickly. Um, I'm just I think kidding. it's I, I think it's batshit crazy to think they're trading Darius. I don't think it's happening. It's batshit crazy. <laughs> I, I think that's cra- I, I mean, the more I think about it, the more I, I look at it, you know, it's it's outlandish. There's no question about it. Um, you know, and it wasn't a t- honestly it was a take at eight seventeen a.m. that. Uh, you know that it's early in the morning and you're and you're thinking through things and you start throwing out the here here's my thought though okay so here's my rebuttal to the rebuttal what happens if 10 months from now the same stuff happens the the same result occurs what a first round playoff loss yep but you're trading Donovan Mitchell well you're trading Donovan Mitchell yeah and you're recouping whatever you can for him and you're going forward with Darius and Evan as the core pieces to this team. And I'm, possibly Jared Allen. And how many years does that set you back? I don't know if it sets you back. He's still got two really good pieces in Darius and Evan Mobley that a lot of under, teams are on the league. Under contract for at least with three no years. Picks. A lot of le- but you get picks back. But you're going to recoup from Donovan right. some oh, of what you lost. Oh, oh so you, you're getting picks back too. I mean, I don't think Who you're going to get four picks, but you're going to get picks back. I mean, back it's here. impossible to... It's impossible to know, but if you want to go the picks route, yes, you're going to get picks back. If you want to go the player route, you can probably get some sort of player back. I, I have no idea. We're trying to project something out now that's 12 months out, 11 months out. But if they lose in the first round again next year, there's probably a lot of people getting fired and Donovan's getting and Donovan's yeah. getting traded because he's got a year left on his contract. He's not coming back. Yeah. So yeah. I guess – go ahead. No, 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 no. You go. I got, I got a next question to take this off this, but you finished all here. Plus, yeah, I, they look, don't have moves to make. Right. Like, that's the other thing. <laughs> like, that. Right. if they had all this cap space or they had, you know, young players under contract that other teams would want or something like that, you know, maybe you're having a different conversation. You have other picks to trade. They opened the cabinets and they threw everything at the Utah to get mm. Donovan. There's mm. nothing left. There's nothing left. And maybe they can swing a sign and trade for one of these guys who's going to be over the mid-level. Maybe. But they're just – they are so limited in what they can do. I just don't think it's realistic to think that there's a big swing out there for them to make because they they made it last year. And it's and teams very rarely have the opportunity to make big swings like that in consecutive off-seasons. It's just because of the assets that it takes to get it done. Right. Uh, uh, unless you swing one of the big assets and do something out of the way out of the box, which – I mean, I, I – th- all signs points them not doing that. I'm not saying 
you know, that they should do that. I think yesterday my point was if – because we were, we were talking about it and we're talking about it now. How do you change this team? Like Mike started the discussion by saying, does it come from within or does it have to come externally? Honestly, like I, I don't know. If I'm the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference, the next season I want to contend for a title. I, yeah. Am I, am I, I don't know if this – I don't consider this team a title contender as they're currently constructed next year. Hey, man, listen, I tell you like this, man, stand on what you stand on. For me, it ain't too many players in the NBA who, who, who can't get traded. I'm sorry. Darius Garland, you're a nice ball player. Darius Garland is not first team all NBA nothing. Let's be real. We like him. He's our guy. We got an affinity for our guy. But I'm not going to sit up here and act like this dude is the second coming yeah. at uh, 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 Steph Curry, Allen Iverson. No, bro. Like, if I'm trying to – I'm looking at – a general manager for the Cleveland Cavaliers has to look at every opportunity to turn over a leaf to get him over the hump because you paid a boatload of picks and assets for Donovan Mitchell. So everybody on the table, everybody on the table, I'm sorry, just keep it real. Hey, in real life, I'm on the table. You on the table. McNuggets on the table. Yeah. Jason ain't on the table. He on the company, but it's all good. <laughs> well, that, that actually leads right to my next question, John. <laughs> Outside of being a Cleveland diehard, you do a lot of your work in the college basketball realm. And you watch more and know more about college basketball than maybe anyone we've ever had on this show. We, we realize college basketball in Cleveland doesn't mesh as, as well as Cleveland Browns and Cleveland fans do. So I'm in the middle of a deep dive into Imani Bates. G has watched, he says, 30 games of his. I know you know college basketball better than 30 kind of steep. 30. I, I said about 15, McNuggets. Oh, Don't sorry, he got trouble. 15. All right. So between oh. us two, we, I, I'm halfway through my deep dive. But, John, you, you call games on the Big East. You are in the college <laughs> basketball world. You've seen Imani Bates for two seasons now, his first season at Memphis, his second season at Eastern Michigan. I, I haven't heard you give your thoughts on Imani Bates, but what do you think of the Cavs pick at 49? So it's a pick that makes sense in the position they were in in the draft. At 49, this was not a particularly great draft class. Uh, and, and, and in any draft class, when you have the 49th pick, if your pick is past 45, there are a ton of agents and players that are starting to call people being like, we don't want to get drafted. We've got a team lined up post-draft that we got an invite from. We, we'd much rather be in that setting. That's a very real thing late in the draft. At 49, the Cavaliers are in a position where, what do you have to do? Well, if, if you're going to do anything in that spot that's that could produce value, uh, and, and I know everybody out there is like, well, Nikola Jokic, Nicole, there's only one. Okay, there was only one Nikola Jokic. There's only one Taco Bell commercial pick that pans out to that. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be honest here. We can't compare him and that pick and the commercial running during it. I've, we've heard that like 70 times. The big quesarito, uh, baby. I love my quesaritos. I've had too many to count. Having said this, uh, you know, you can't – we can't get into the world of, uh, of, of, you know, comparing and contrasting and all that. Here's the thing with Imani Bates. He's six foot ten. His length and playmaking are things that stand out. They're, they've got potential. When you can combine that frame and that length with the ability to handle the ball and score, okay, I, I could see the projectable. I could see why you picked him 49. Now let's talk about why he was 49. He has been criticized for kind of being lazy at times, uh, being focused on himself, mm -hmm. not really being a particularly great teammate, uh, not looking for the right basketball play, but looking for the play that helps Imani. Now, here's the thing. He's not coming into this organization and contributing this upcoming year. Uh, anything that he did this upcoming year would be surprising to me uh, and I think it would be it, it would be surprising to people in NBA circles, that's for sure. Uh, NBA circles, frankly, don't love Imani Bates uh, and don't see how he pans out. But, but, what do the Cavaliers have that not every NBA organization has? They've got great people running their ship. They've got stability. They've got a, a program and um, a connection and locally, I mean, their, their G League team plays, what, right next door. They've got the connection to potentially groom a project like this 
and make him a better basketball player who makes smarter basketball decisions, who becomes more mature. He, he's got the, the potential. I mean, there, th- th- that's there. I don't think it's at the, it's nowhere close to the degree as where it was when this kid was 15 years old. That was unfair. That the Sports Illustrated article that he could be the next Durant, we should never call a 15 year old that. I mean, mm-hmm. not to get preachy, but it's not fair to a 15 year old in today's climate. Because if they ever have failure, look at today's era of social media. Kid, kid has gotten torn apart the last two, three, four years of his life. Kid has gotten criticized. He's brought some of it upon himself. You know, charges were dropped, but he had things that were away from the basketball floor that, that ended up causing him some trouble and caused some drama behind the scenes. But, you know, he could not find his footing at Memphis. He ends up at Eastern Michigan. And frankly, Eastern Michigan was a better team when Imani Bates was off the floor than when he was on it. So I get the idea of Imani Bates. I don't blame the Cavaliers at all for picking him at number 49. But let's be real here. There's a better chance that this doesn't pan out than it does. But that happens a lot of times when you're making a late draft pick. The pick made sense. We'll see if Imani Bates' development does too. We got time for one more here, John and G. Oh, listen, well, we didn't even get to the Guardians. Like, we, I wanted to talk to you a little about little Guardians. Um, you know, you take a look at this, uh, you know, three young prospects. Um, we talk about uh, Shane Bieber and whether or not he's going to be moved. Um, you know, are you of the uh, thought process that you keep Shane Bieber? Uh, you don't trade him this year. It's almost like the Donovan Mitchell effect, <laughs> but it's the Shane Bieber effect. Like, are you going to get it what you get for him? Are you going to keep him? Are you going to – where you? Where do you land on, on Shane Bieber um, now that the Guardians are technically in first place by a slim margin? I know. I, it, you know, it's it's interesting because we're talking about a, a first-place baseball team that, that is under 500. And, and frankly, has a little shot to win a, a World Series. I mean, I understand the the arguments out there of of well, you know, um, look at baseball and qualifying for October and just get a ticket, just get a ticket to the postseason, and you never know what can happen. Guys, that's not baseball this year. I mean, it just isn't. There's. I was reading a tweet last night from a guy who covers the sport nationally. He's like, the great thing about this season is there's like four fan bases that are happy with their team. Like right now there isn't, there's not parody this year in the sport. You look at the start, start that Tampa Bay got off to. If you look at the, the whole American league East division versus the central, I mean, the, the American league has seven teams that are under 500, five of them, all five uh, from the AL central make up, out of the seven teams in the American League that are under 500, you, you got to be, you got to look at the, the writing on the wall. They can't pay Shane Bieber. Could they still win the American League Central without Shane Bieber? Yes, they could. They they could do that. Uh, this division is not very good, and the Guardians still have talent. They've got they've got talent, and they've got developing talent. And I'd like to see them do some things in their outfield a little bit differently. I'm done with the Miles Straw experiment. I know that that show's had plenty of that on here already. I don't need to go on a tangent uh, off, off that somewhere. Someone's ears are ringing, and we all know who. Uh, but I, I think that they can trade Shane Bieber. I think they should train Sh- trade Shane Bieber because I, I just I think you got to be real for the now, and you could get some ready now talent potentially. You can also build up your farm even more. You can look towards the future and. I still think you're going to have a competitive enough team to be able to to make a run. The, the biggest factors for this team to keep up their recent play, they're seven and three in their last ten, they're fourteen and eight since June the third. Are they've got to have offensive versatility? Andreas Jimenez has got to keep hitting. Can they get Josh Bell going a little bit more? Because it's been it, it's 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 not been great thus far. But I, I think you got to trade Shane Bieber. I think it's the right thing to do. It's the best. It's in the best interest of the organization to do so. I hate it. I know it's part of the, the climate. I know it's things that we don't like. But I think, again, uh, that it's it's sometimes what you have to do for your organization's best interest. They could still win this division. I think they will win this division. But I think it's the best move uh, for the Guardians and their present and future. That is John Fanta, college basketball extraordinaire, Cleveland native and diehard making his debut on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. The first but not the last, John, we 
Appreciate you taking some time to hang out with us today. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Fellas, thank you for having me. Have a happy fourth, Cleveland. Awesome. Right. That was John Fenton. We're going to pivot.